first sessions in our conference, Microbiology, with the keynote speaker, uh, Professor Hanan Malkawi from uh, Yarmouk University, uh, Department of Biology, Biological Sciences. Um, uh, her talk will be about adaptation and diversity of microorganisms to grow and reduce in extreme harsh environments. Dr. Uh, Hanan Malkawi, uh, you can start your talk if you are, uh, uh, and yeah. you can share, you can share your, your presentation from yes, your- Yes, I, I will start now sharing. Yeah, go ahead. Is it clear now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, طبعاً, uh, and I would like really to uh, uh, يعني extend a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Maali, Dr. Marwan Awartani, the Minister of Education, uh, and also for the uh, Palestinian Academy of Science and Technology, and for the really uh, the which I call really يعني فعلا متميز اللي هو ما سميته أنتم في التجمع الفلسطيني للعلوم الحياتية or Palestinian Society for Biological uh, Sciences. Uh, أنا سعيدة جدا إني أنا invited uh, to be keynote speaker for this uh, annual conference. طبعا أنا as I know إنه في بعض ال speakers they are non Arabic speakers فحضرت ال presentation في الإنجليزي. لكن if you prefer, أنا I will talk both يعني English and Arabic. إيش رأيك دكتور شرف بقدر أستخدم؟ English, English, English. Just the, the opening ceremony it's in Arabic and the rest of the okay. conference will be in English. Okay. Let me now share the screen and make it full. Uh, okay. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Sharaf uh, mentioned, the title of my talk will be Adaptation and Diversity of Microorganisms uh, Thrive in Extreme or What We Call Harsh Environments. Uh, I will talk about definition, what do we mean by extreme or harsh environments, uh, and how then we classify microbes according to these environmental conditions, which are extreme. And then I will talk more about some of my research work on extreme environments. Uh, some of these environments are in Jordan and then uh, lately in the outer space. And of course, uh, some useful applications of these uh, extremophiles. Now, what is an extreme environment? Uh, there are so many definitions, but in general, it's a habitat which is uh, characterized by uh, stress or harsh environmental conditions, which are beyond our development range or, or our living as a human beings. For example, we talk about extreme pH, like uh, very acidic, it could be two, or very basic, uh, nine. Uh, extreme temperature, very cold, like minus 20, or very high temperature above boiling, 113 degrees Celsius, high salt concentrations, radiation, pressure, microgravity, and dry conditions, which I will talk about some of these during my talk. Now, in, in nature, you where we could find these uh, diverse environments. As you see in this uh, picture, uh, which I have taken uh, from uh, uh, frontier of microbiology journal, we could find the extreme environments in several places. For example, when we talk about sea ice or polar regions where there is a uh, very low uh, temperature, uh, or we could talk about uh, cold and mud volcanoes, uh, shallow water or hydrothermal vents, uh, hot springs uh, and mud volcanoes where there is you know, high uh, temperature. Uh, also, we could talk about deserts, environment, our dry conditions, uh, acid mine drainage, uh, deep uh, sea uh, anoxic or anaerobic uh, conditions where there's no oxygen, and, and so on. Uh, or, for example, soda or uh, very high salt concentration that I will, inshallah, talk about in more detail. So, Alkaline, uh, they are habitats where we have a pH above nine 
or uh, we have another extreme environment in terms of pH requirement, acidic, where the pH could be below five, extreme cold habitats below five, or and this includes the uh, polar uh, regions and uh, deep oceans, extreme hot environments where temperature could reach more than 40 degrees centigrade, and this will include uh, Yellowstone National Parks and some hot springs that are distributed all over the world. Hypersaline, <clears throat> this is a very high salt concentration. And this could include, for example, uh, Salt Lake City in the United States, Dead Sea in Jordan, uh, under pressure, uh, habitats under extreme hydrostatic pressure, radiation, where some microbes could adapt to live in an uh, environment that have high doses of radiation, and uh, this will include high UV or infrared radiation, uh, dry conditions or uh, environment without water, without free water. This includes deserts environment and other dry conditions environment, anaerobic or without oxygen. And uh, this will include habitats in deeper sediments, polluted environments, regardless what type of pollution. Uh, it could be heavy metals, organic compounds, oil, hydrocarbons, etc., and the outer space, where the conditions are really extreme there, like uh, microgravity or near zero gravity in the space environment. Accordingly, microorganisms could be classified according to <clears throat> this harsh environment. By the way, if my voice is not clear or you have any clarification, you can please uh, stop me anytime, okay? Is it clear, my voice? Somebody answer me, is it clear? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, <clears throat> okay. Hala, when we say thermophiles, these are organisms that could grow at optimum temperature. Imagine this will be for them is an optimum. For us, of course, we cannot live in this temperature. And this could range from 45 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. Or hyperthermophiles, where organisms could thrive up to or greater than 80 degrees centigrade. And this could include hot springs, hydrothermal vents, and mainly, of course, we are talking about prokaryotic life. Uh, also, according to pH, as I mentioned, uh, of course, E. coli that lives in our body, it is, uh, we call it neutrophile. Uh, this is not extreme condition or harsh condition. Acidophile, uh, some organisms could live at pH يعني, very low, it could reach to pH 3, like, for example, a bacteria called Acidophyobacillus peroxidans. Or some microbes could live in a high pH, which is alkaline. Uh, for example, Bacillus fermus could live in, uh, uh, this is for them in optimum condition. Imagine, يعني, pH 9. Or, according to salt, Stichia coli is considered non-halophile. It does not uh, tolerate uh, extremes in salt condition. For example, halo tolerance such as staph aureus, they could tolerate uh, NaCl concentration around, you know, four to five percent. Uh, halophile like Elveopebrio fishery, and this could tolerate uh, P, uh, uh, NaCl concentration like nine or ten. And we have the extreme halophiles, such as Halobacterium selenium, and this is above 15%, where we have in the Dead Sea, I have some work has, that has been done on microbes that are really tolerate very high percentage of salt. Uh, also, according to radiation, uh, of course, they could be bacteria, fungi, or viruses. I will just pick one or two examples. For example, the bacteria that is named Dinococcus radiodurans, they could tolerate uh, ionizing radiation dose of 2,200. Uh, look at this uh, virus. It's uh, the one that causes foot and mouth disease. Uh, unfortunately, it is uh, spreading this disease now between uh, school kids in the schools. Uh, this virus could tolerate uh, dose, uh, ionizing dose radiation up to 13,000 gray. Okay. <clears throat> After this intro, how these microbes could adapt, or what mechanisms these microbes have to let them, or to allow them to adapt to such harsh environments. Uh, 
uh, there are several mechanisms. <laughs> For example, uh, the maintenance of stable functional biological membrane. Here we talk about the cell membrane. Uh, it's, this is really an important uh, mechanism to allow cellular life in extreme environments. Because we know so many biological conditions and enzymatic reactions occur in the cell membrane, they are essential membranes for to produce energy. Uh, so the, the changes in the composition of, of membrane lipids allow them to adapt either to high or low temperature. Uh, and because the fluidity of the membrane here will be affected. So these microbes are really clever. They are smart. They could really do such a mechanism to allow them to thrive and tolerate and even consider such con conditions as optimum for them. Also, there could be adaptation in the three-dimensional folding of proteins, which is responsible, of course, for so many bio biochemical activity for the enzymes that are on the membrane. Also, extremophiles, uh, which are microbes that tolerate or live in the extreme environment, we call them extremophiles, to preserve their cellular constituents, they tend to synthesize and accumulate small molecules like proteins or others in their cytoplasm to maintain a stable molecular structure. Also, maintaining the protein integrity involves optimizing the protein modification system, not just the folding. Uh, it could be other also mechanisms to prevent aggregation or uh, uh, destruction by intracellular proteases. So this is really very, very good quality control system for the proteins that are on the membrane, specifically for the thermophiles or cyclophiles organisms. Now I will talk uh, a little bit in more detail about some of my research work uh, that has been done on extreme environments and how they adapt microbes to such conditions. Uh, this project uh, has been done by uh, my, one of my graduate students. She was doing her master's degree and earned her master's thesis in this topic. Her name is Manal Umari. I'm always proud of my students, by the way. And I'm always like Sharaf. He was one of my students. And uh, where, where they go, I follow them, in fact. Really, I'm, I'm really proud. So what she did, in fact, uh, she has done this research on several, more than 200 uh, hot springs that are uh, distributed in Jordan. We have some hot springs in the north part of Jordan, uh, some in the middle part, and some in the south part of Jordan, طبعاً, with different names. Temperature ranges طبعاً, uh, for these hot springs from 40 to 70 degrees centigrade. So the purpose of the work was to investigate the diversity of bacterial and archaeal population using both conventional cultural, which is the cultural method mainly, microbiological conventional method, and the cultural independent molecular approach. So also the other objectives we were hoping, and that's what we did in fact, as I will show you in the work, to isolate and identify some cultivable isolates, either bacteria or archaea, from Jordanian hot springs and store them to be hopefully novel microbes to have some uh, useful application either in biotechnology or industry or in food or uh, other useful applications. So what we did, uh, there were a collection of samples from uh, uh, either water samples or mat samples from these uh, sites that I was talking to you about, the, the hot springs. And chemical analysis were done to these samples and molecular uh, analysis have been done also to these samples as I will show you in a minute. I said we use both cultural, conventional microbiological methods and independent, cultural independent methods or molecular methods. We use for the cultural methods, we use cultivation and isolation of some really unique thermophilic bacteria, uh, and we use different cultural media. And we even investigated their ability to grow in different uh, salt concentration, mainly in ACL, from 7, 12 to 15. Uh, we also use some uh, morphological uh, characterization by gram stain and you, you, you noticing, observing their morphology on the uh, culture plates 
that I will show you in a minute. And also we use transmission electron microscope to investigate their morphology in detail and the determination also of their tolerance to grow at either high temperature or at high salt concentration. Now, as you all know, to understand life under extreme condition, this is really a very challenging. Lil, because most of the microbes cannot be cultivated. Yani, due to, to this difficulty in in vitro cultivation, we move to the molecular also methods. So as literature indicates, more than 99% of microbes or microorganisms cannot be cultivated. So we used culture independent method. And in this uh, project, we mainly focused on archaea and bacteria. Of course, uh, metagenomic DNA extraction has been done directly from water and mat samples, okay? And also total genomic DNA extraction were done from the pure culture that uh, we have from the bacterial isolate that we isolated also in this project. Uh, then PCR amplification was done and uh, using either uh, 16 S ribosomal RNA or specific primers for certain bacteria that are known to live or tolerate uh, harsh environmental conditions. Uh, and this is some of the result. What we have got, uh, almost we have 132 different bacterial isolates were cultivated and isolated from these different hot springs. As you could see, just by looking directly at the culture place, uh, uh, the morphology, some of them are different, the color, because they have, some of them have pigments and, and so on. We analyzed all of these features. Uh, out of these 132 bacterial isolates, 125 were gram positive roads, either singly or in chains. And seven bacterial isolates were gram-positive cocci or cocobacilli under gram stain. And this is how they look. These are few slides under the transmission electron microscope. Uh, very, very beautiful. In fact, I, I like this uh, research that Manal did. Uh, also, some of the results, uh, when they have been tested, these isolates under the uh, growth under different temperature, 19 bacterial isolates were able to grow at higher temperature from 50 degrees centigrade to 75. Uh, also, as for the pH range of their bacterial growth, one single bacterial isolate is a thermoacidophilic bacterial isolate, and it was from uh, Zarkamain spring. Uh, it grew on bacillus media at pH margin, very, very low pH, it's acidic, 3.5. And the upper growth temperature for this isolate was 70 or 75. Uh, also, they have been tested under different NACL concentration. Uh, we found that three thermophilic bacterial isolates from Zara Spring were able to grow uh, at salt condition more than even 12% NACL. And this is the results, of course, I will not uh, go into details, but this is uh, amplification, PCR amplification for water and mat samples of the metagenomic, we call it metagenomic because we isolate the total DNA directly from the environmental sample, either if it is water or mat samples. And uh, we could find, in fact, some of these unique bands that corresponds to certain bacteria or archaeal species. Uh, we also went to the 16S ribosomal DNA sequences of green and sulfur bacteria from the metagenomic DNA isolated from mat samples and some of the isolates that have this band, which is unique to the green non sulfur bacteria. Also, we found some unique bands to purple phototrophic bacteria, again, from metagenomic DNA isolated from the mat sample here. And also, PCR amplification was done for 16S ribosomal DNA sequences of the genomic DNA isolated from bacterial isolates here, not the uh, metagenomic, it's the DNA from the bacterial isolates that we were able to isolate using a specific primer for the genus Bacillus. And so many of the bacterial isolates were, uh, we found they belong to the genus because of the band here, uh, it's specific to the genus Bacillus. 
So in summary to the results here, in the 132 thermophilic bacterial isolates were isolated from hot springs. Majority of them belong to the genus Bacillus with, of course, some different morphological characteristics, which suggest several species. 19 out of 32 were able to grow at high temperature up to 75 degrees centigrade. 16 out of 32 were able to grow at 7% NaCl and three isolates at 12 percent in ACL, one single thermoacidophilic bacterial isolate it grew at pH 3.5 and temperature up to 70 degrees centigrade. So again, also we found some phototrophic green bacteria and purple uh, uh, bacteria. Uh, the other projects of other extreme or harsh environment I consider is an EU-funded project and it's on oil polluted and other pollutant environments. Uh, uh, as you know, bacteria are the most common dominant microbiota that are involved in oil bioremediation. Uh, the general objective of the, this project, project was to uh, really, uh, يعني, it's like making a map or catalog and exploit and manage microbial diversity available in the Mediterranean Sea and Gulf of Aqaba for bioremediation of polluted sites. This project included uh, five EU countries and four Arab countries from Egypt. So the Arab countries were Egypt, uh, Morocco, Jordan, and also uh, uh, other Arab uh, country. It's, it's four, we, have, we were four, including Jordan. And uh, for the European, they were from Italy, from uh, Spain, from Belgium, and uh, other also European countries. It's an FP7 project. So the, the specific objectives of this uh, project, uh, it was a three years project uh, with a budget of more than 3 million uh, euro. Uh, it's to define the first half of microbial diversity associated with polluted sites, establish a collection of microbial isolates, uh, that have the capability of bioremediation and identify new functions by employing integrated novel approach of metagenomic and metabolic techniques and of course to develop novel uh, processes for marine bioremediation. Uh, Dr. Hanan? Yes. Bad Iznik, you have five minutes. Oh really? <laughs> like, uh, I will be very quick. Okay. Uh, uh, these are the sites in the Mediterranean Sea that have been used for collection of samples. And uh, for Aqaba, the reason we used, or Aqaba was used as a site, uh, is to, uh, it, it was chosen as a reference for potential climate uh, change situation with the global warming, you know, uh, trend that's happening in the world. So what we did, there were four collection uh, sample uh, sites in Aqaba, along the sites of the Aqaba. Uh, some of it were contaminated with phosphate, somewhere with oil or with sulfur, and the marine science station was the control site. Uh, uh, I will go very quickly. We did the cultural and non-cultural uh, approaches. These are some of the photos of the polluted. You could see the oil here from the tankers that transferred the oil across the Gulf of Aqaba from other countries. And uh, we found some microbes that were really well adapted to live under such polluted environment. These are more photos of this. Uh, this is how we would collect the samples. We have divers. This is one of my colleague. Now he is a professor uh, in also uh, University of Jordan. Uh, we have to go down to uh, 200 or uh, 20 meters down. Uh, then uh, we uh, did a lot of uh, analysis. We searched these isolates for the production of surfactant or ability to grade hydrocarbons. We did uh, biochemical uh, and morphological, molecular, all the analysis that we really think of that we did it. We have uh, isolated a lot of microbes. We found like 65% of them were uh, belonging to gamma proteobacteria. Uh, this is a summary of all the isolates. We have majority, uh, it's the gamma proteobacteria. We have thermocules beta proteobacteria and others. Uh, some of them were able to produce uh, uh, biofilm, 68%. Some of them were able, 68% also, percent, to produce biosurfactant. We also made 
The first, we start with the violet experiment, 500 mil uh, in the lab that contains the minimal media, the consortium of the bacteria that has ability to degrade oil and the crude oil. And then we scaled up this to 20 liter and then to 2000 liter. And as you see here, this is the 2000 liter because we have to mimic the real situation in the Gulf itself. We cannot dump our consortia directly in the Gulf of Aqaba, but we have to do large tankers. And when we took samples, you could see, you could see here that the bacteria, the consortium of bacteria that we put, the cocktail of the consortium uh, that have, were able to degrade hydrocarbons. After, look here, nine days, you could see clearance. It's almost clear after 11 or two weeks. This is really unique. And, and uh, يعني, we, we are now in the process of maybe filing some patents on this. Uh, so I, because of the time is limiting, as uh, Victor Radir said, so I will say in the diversity database of this project, microbial species was established. We have released very, very uh, important and unique results. Uh, I will go directly now to the current project, which is uh, studying microbial life in outer space. This is one of my uh, recent funded projects. And we, the, the objectives of this uh, project that we are doing with the KSF uh, Space Foundation in UK and in the United States, but we are leading this project. I'm the principal investigator of this project. And the purpose was to better understand how bacteria respond in near zero gravity and to explore if space environment can be used to stimulate certain planetary environment and if there is if life is possible on, in, on outer space, and hopefully also to lead to better bacterial control mechanism. Uh, this mechanism could prove valuable to maintain both the human and machine life abroad. Uh, we, the, the, the capsule, the space capsule, will hold our samples, uh, and it will be launched this month it will be launched from Spain. There is a station there in Spain. It will hold our bacterial and DNA samples. And it will be launched to reach about 32 kilometers in the outer space. And they, because they are in closed container, this will protect bacterial cells uh, during the ascent to the Earth's atmosphere. When it is back, immediately after one or two days, it will be back to the earth. Then it will be exposed immediately in our lab to different analysis. Uh, different conditions will be uh, also uh, analyzed and also a molecular uh, study will be done. We will see at the gene level what happened if there is a mutation uh, that made these bacteria, if they are still alive, uh, uh, to tolerate such uh, extreme environment in space, either radiation or near zero gravity. Now, what useful application of, of uh, extremophiles we could have? Of course, there are so many uh, biotechnological and industry and in food and in agriculture. For example, uh, uh, psychrophiles, the enzymes that are there could be really used in the dairy industry, in uh, cleaning up the environment by remediation, we have in biofuel industry uh, for starch liquefaction, for example, for the thermophiles and water treatment, uh, for the halophiles the, uh, industry. And this is the final slide uh, because of all these enzymes that are present in the extremophile. And thank you so much for listening to me. I hope I was on time. Okay. Dr. Ghadir, have you talked طبعا احنا بنشكر دكتورة حنان ملكاوي على هاي البرزنتيشن والموضوع الشيق واللي بيفتح افاق لان احنا حتى نفكر نشتغل اشي في الجامعة عنا ممكن يكون في شغل مشترك بيننا وبينكم ان شاء الله في الايام القادمة وهذا هو الهدف اصلا من المؤتمر طبعا احنا المفروض انه متأخرين شوي في الوقت فبهمش بدنا نستأذن الجميع بدنا نخلي السبيكرز يقدموا محاضراتهم ونأجل الأسئلة في آخر السيشن في اللي هي وقت الجنرال ديسكشن طبعاً بعديها بناخد بريك ف 
نفتح مجال للتوكر السبيكر التالي اللي هو الدكتور عاطف تفضل دكتور شرف اذا بتحب تقدمه طيب يعطيكم العافيه الجميع معنا المتحدث الثاني بعد الدكتور حنا الملكاوي اللي هو عاطف زاهدي عاطف زاهدي من فروم فلسطين بروتكنيك يونيفرسيتي from applied biology he just finished his uh, bachelor degree in applied biology uh, this uh, project or, or this research project it has been done under the supervision of the miss arwa mujahid uh, his talk will be uh, entitled association between water electrolytes and bacterial antibiotic resistant developments in drinking water so uh, Atif, do you hear me? <coughs> Go ahead. Doctor Atif, if you allow me, just open it from the two sides. It's like you're doing a mistake. You have to open one of them if you allow me. After that, I blocked one. Okay. تمام صباح الخير جميعا بداية الأمر research talking about association between water electrolytes and bacterial antibiotic resistant development in drinking water had, uh, this study was performed for Hebron city at the beginning our uh, presentation uh, contents the presence in this slide Okay, at the beginning, we will talk about introduction. Introduction talking about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. <laughs> antibiotics uh, definition are uh, drugs or medicine that used to kill and inhibit the bacterial growth. Antibiotic resistant bacteria are bacteria that uh, can grow or have the ability to grow in the presence of uh, one antibiotics and more. Okay, here we'll talk about antibiotic uh, resistance mechanisms. Uh, bacteria become resistant uh, to the antibiotics by many mechanisms, include the reduction of membrane permeability, uh, drug inactivation, rapid efflux of antibiotics by using protein bump, also by mutation of cellular target. Okay, here we'll talk about the water electrolytes. Electrolytes naturally found in the drinking water that have uh, many vital important role uh, for the water composition and for the human. Uh, so, uh, these uh, minerals include uh, copper, potassium, and iron, and so on. Okay, antibiotic, uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria causes. There is two main causes for, uh, for uh, bacteria to become resistant to antibiotics. The first one is intrinsic resistance uh, that naturally found inside the bacteria. For example, uh, vancomycin resistance, Shersha coli, acquired resistance. This resistance uh, acquired from, mainly from the, ex uh, the external factor and habitats include misuse or overuse of antibiotics, conjugation by gene transfer process, mutations and environmental stress and conditions. And we focused on this point in our research. Oxygen reactive species, you will talk about the reactive oxygen species. The definition of reactive oxygen species is the toxic unstable molecules uh, that uh, contain oxygen and uh, two pairs of electrons that can react, uh, react easily with other molecules in the cell. Uh, that regarded to be byproduct from many bio, uh, biochemical reactions inside the cell, such as uh, respiration and photosynthesis. Uh, the reactive oxygen species are eliminated from the cell by antioxidant enzymes, such as peroxidase uh, enzyme. The oxidative stress results from the over up of reactive oxygen species and the toxification ability of cell to eliminate it from the cell. The buildup of uh, reactive oxygen species have many negative effects on the bacteria. Uh, target uh, on the macromolecules that found in the cell, such as DNA, RNA, and the proteins, and maybe lead to apoptosis. Oxidative stress, here we'll talk about the sources of oxidative stress can be exogenous or endogenous, and we focus in our research on the exogenous sources, specifically on the chemicals. Uh, reduce the oxidative stress inside the cell by using antioxidants to convert the reactive oxygen species to less reactive, uh, less reactive molecules, and the accumulation of reactive, reactive oxygen species have many negative and positive effects on the cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, this figure represents the affinity reaction. Here we can see uh, how, uh, how the electrolytes such as copper and iron 
can act as a, as a catalyst to generate reactive oxygen species that, uh, that have many negative effects on the cell. Oxidative stress effect on the DNA, protein, and lipid. Okay, we'll talk about uh, the uh, negative effect uh, of the reactive species on the macromolecules. The first one is DNA. Uh, reactive species lead to DNA oxidation, and uh, due to the low, low correct percentage of this, uh, this process may, may be lead to uh, mutation, gene mutations. Protein, amino acid oxidation, change in the structure and folding of a protein, and maybe lead uh, to produce a protein with a new function or inactivation. Lipid, lipid beer oxidation, flu uh, fluidity and integrity impairing, maybe lead to reduced membrane permeability. Okay. Okay, we'll talk about aim and objectives. The main aim in uh, our research is to know the association between water electrolytes and bacterial antibiotic resistance development in tap water. Objective, there is two main uh, objectives in our research. The first one is to determine how metals electrolytes promote the anti antibiotic resistance bacteria and to determine the future risk that can be resulted from drinking water. Tools and materials. Okay, this slide. Chab, Jan, you know, the host uh, has asked you to start your video. Oh, tell me. Okay, this slide represents the reagents and tools uh, that we use in our research. Methodology. At the beginning, six water sample, uh, six water sample of uh, drinking water uh, were collected from different regions and the uh, sources from the Hebron city. And this map represents uh, the location of this uh, water sample. Then step two, bacterial wa uh, was filtrated and cultivated in general purpose media by vacuum filtration. Step two, isolation and cultivation of bacteria by using uh, diff uh, different type of selective and differential media. Step two, bacterial identification. Uh, the, bacteria, the isolated bacteria were identified by using uh, many tests, biochemical tests, and by using uh, different type of selective and differential media, such as M MSA and McConkie and so on. Electrolyte exposure, the isolated bacteria was exposed to depending on their concentration in the drinking water. Finally, a uh, sensitive test uh, was performed for the exposed bacteria by using qp method. Results and discussion. Okay, here the, this table represents the antibiotic accessibility test for Mycetomonas arginosa that affected by iron. We can see here the jump from sensitive uh, zone of inhibition uh, to resistance. We can see here uh, for Fox antibiotics, the Mycetomonas uh, was resistance and the uh, reversal relationship we can see here for the, the diameter of uh, zone of inhibition and the concentration of iron. Here, uh, the resistance remain resistant. There is no change in the zone of inhibition diameter. For gentamicin, we can see here at the beginning, uh, the results were sensitive and converted to resistance at high concentration of iron. Antibiotic accessibility test for, uh, for Bacidomonas arginosa affected by cover. Also, we can see the, uh, the development or increase, uh, decrease in the zone of inhibition diameter uh, with increase uh, the cover concentrations here. Also here we can see uh, the decrease in the zone of emission diameter without change in uh, the trait resistance or intermediate or sensitive. Okay, here for potassium, antibiotic test for potassium. There is no any significant change uh, in the zone of emission diameter results for the potassium. Antibiotic accessibility results for Shigella. Also here we can see uh, the association between iron concentration and the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. In the gentamicin, for Fox antibiotics, the results remain the same. For cyberfloxacin, we can see here uh, the highly jump in the zone of inhibition diameter from 23 to 10, and, and uh, again returned to 40. And uh, this is due to two main uh, reasons. The, the first one is imbalance in the osmotic strength. Rapid, and the second- You have extra one minute or two minutes maximum. Okay. Uh, the second one is the mutant microbes were corrected again and the return sensitive. For the cover also, we can see the, the association between the cover concentration and the antibiotic resistant development. For potassium, there is no change in the diameter, the same. Staphylococcus awareness, 
in iron and copper and potassium. Also, we can see the development in the antibiotic resistance rate for uh, all uh, the electrolytes, copper and iron and potassium. For Staphylococcus, uh, for Staphylococcus aureus, there is no any significant change uh, in the results of uh, accessibility tests, so uh, it remained the same. Uh, that's due to the, uh, the adaptation mechanism of Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, here in the slide, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the effect of iron and copper on, on the cell. At the beginning, we'll talk about the iron. DNA damage mutation can lead to new traits such as antibiotic resistance. Uh, also can affect on the membrane lipid. Peroxidation can impair in membrane permeability. Also, cysteine and methionine uh, residuous oxidation can lead to, uh, to form a new intra and inter SS bond formation. Uh, cover uh, effects. The first one is DNA damage mutation can lead to new traits. Membrane lipid peroxidation and due to the high affinity of carbon replaces iron cofactor by manganese in a protein can lead to change the structure and change the protein activity. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is no change, any significant change in the cephalococcus or adaptation uh, that is due to uh, cephalococcus results, sorry, that is due to uh, the adaptation mechanisms of these bacteria. These mechanisms include phalloxanthine pigments that give potent antioxidants that destroy the reactive species, also having a large number of antioxidant enzymes, such as metabolic that eliminate the metals, reduce the negative charge of sodium. Okay, uh, this figure represents uh, how Staphylococcus aureus reduced the negative charge by adding the aniline positively charged on the lipotycoic acid. Conclusion. For Pseudomonas arginosa, proportional relationship between iron and copper concentration and antibiotic resistance development. For Staphylococcus epidermis, also the same, in addition to the potassium. For Shigella, proportional relationship between iron and copper concentration and antibiotic resistance development. For Staphylococcus aureus, there is no, there is no uh, resistance happened because of Staphylococcus adaptation mechanisms. Finally, recommendations. Uh, based on uh, our finding, we recommended that the municipality and all citizens save water in, con uh, in containers devoided of any metals composition, specifically iron and copper. Will iron and copper concentration shouldn't exceed one milligram per liter in water to reduce the possibility of antibiotic resistance development. Also, uh, we recommend the people uh, that use the groundwater as a drinking water to avoid drinking from uh, this uh, type of water without a treatment process because it's rich in minerals with high concentration of these minerals and the possibility of the presence of antibiotic resistance bacteria is high. Thanks for listening. Uh, shukran, Dr. Atif, for the presentation of the and the beneficial. Of course, any questions, as we said, we will adjust to the end of the session, the talks and the two talks, so we will open the floor to the participants from the audience. يبقوا معنا للإجابة على أي أسئلة ممكن تكون تتوجه لحضراتكم بترك المجال لدكتور شرف يقدم دكتورة بشرة بس قبل ما دكتور شرف تسمح لي في عنا المشاركة آية إبراهيم مش موجودة معنا بس ده تأكد بلاش تكون داخل باسم أو إشي آية موجودة معنا إذا في الأتندنس إذا أي موجودة لو سمحت ترفع إيدك وفي آدل سلايمة رافع إيده من أجل أي سؤال أو إجابة لنهاية السيشنز مش عارفة آية لحد هلا ما ظهرت على كل حال دكتور شرف تفضل المتحدث الآخر لهذا السيشنز of microbiology uh, Ms. Bushra El Hashlamon and Bayan Annachi from Palestine Biotechnic University, uh, Department of Applied Biology, under the supervision of Dr. Robin Al Here, there will be a comparison of antibody titers following different vaccination schedules for infectious bronchitis virus on two chicken farms in Hebrew. So it's your turn now. Uh, I have a presentation. I have a presentation. I 
yarışıyor. حدا من المتحدثين لو سمحتوا تفتحوا كاميرا عشان الكل يتعرف على المتحدث فإذا ممكن نحط الكاميرا بدون صورة تفتح كاميرا شخصية كأنه في مؤتمر يعني احنا في مؤتمر أساسا أيوة شكرا إليك شكرا اه بس الصوت شوي علي Thank you to all attendees who are watching. لو سمحتي ترفع الصوت كتير واطي. Today I will present my project applied to the body seeker in different cities. Titled "Conversion of Antibody Titer Following Different Vaccination Schedule for Infectious Bronchitis Virus and Tushkin Fall in Hebron" by Supervisor Dr. Robin Abu Ghazali. The slide show. Uh, this slide show has this outline. Uh, first, we will talk a uh, general introduction about infectious bronchitis virus. Uh, then, the problem and the objective of this study, uh, material and results, finally, results and discussion. Uh, introduction The poultry seeker contributes between 40 to 50 percent of the livestock production in Palestine. So, this ratio indicates the, uh, this ratio indicates the production of seeker represent a large and vital part of the Palestine economy. But viral disease is the most severe obstacle in Abida. Uh, one of the most important of this disease, uh, infectious bronchitis virus. Bushra, لو سمحتي ممكن تقربي على المايك بشرة. I believe it is a viral RNA gene with and non-segmented. Bushra. Classification of virus. لو سمحتي تقربي على المايك عشان الصوت. Stop family from Corona virus. Family from Corona virus and order from Nido virus. This is viral structure composed of the many protein membrane. وين بشرة؟ ايش صار؟ دكتور شرف نعم نعم شو آه شو شو انت عملت ميوت للكل؟ نو لا 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 هي لا ما عملت ميوت لحدا انا بس وصلتني معلومه انه الجهاز اللابتوب عندها طفى لا بشرى؟ نعم طيب شو هلا اتس اوكي حاليا يعني المفروض حطته في الكهرباء وشحنته ما بعرف نعطيها فيو مينتس عشان ترجع يلا هيا عمالة بتدخل عمالة Hello. Surface protein, membrane protein, uh, to protect the genetic material through life cycle. Then, envelope protein, uh, 
uh, engulf protein uh, to then nucleocapsid uh, located uh, directly with RNA genome to, to form a helical ribonucleoprotein protein cap uh, complex. Spike protein. Spike protein is a glycoprotein uh, coated with polysaccharide molecules to accomplish from the host immune system, uh, composed of the two subunits, S1 subunit involved in the virus and the outer outlier of the virus. To, uh, and the S2 subunit uh, have a cell uh, to fuse the cell membrane virus with the cell membrane of the host cell. And now, what is infectious bronchitis disease? Uh, avian infectious bronchitis was uh, first uh, described in the United States in America in the 19th uh, cases. Uh, it's acute respiratory disease, minorly in young chicken, transferred from chicken to chicken directly. بشرى بشرى لو سمحتي اربع المايك ارفعي صوتك يا دوبك سامعين احنا بعد اذنك كمان كمان كثير الصوت واطي ووتري ارجيومنت ناو وير ديز ذا ايديا اوف بروجكت كم فروم ماني بالستينيان فار فاكسينيتد اجينست اي بي بي بس از نوت سفيشنت تو بروفايد بروتكشن ان ذا اول ستين And another problem in Palestine, the prevalence of IBV is, is not being quantitative. So the level of risk of Palestine in flood is unknown. So the, obje the ma uh, major objective of this study, improve the vaccination program in poultry farm in Hebron with the provide the best efficiency at the low cost. Minor objective, measure the prevalence of the IBV among, uh, among several poultry farms in Hebron. The population of this study applied uh, in Palestine Polytechnic University in laboratory of the Korean Syntax, and this is area among two sample collecting. For vaccination program, uh, the four different vaccination models ap applied uh, across uh, two farms. Each farm have two fires. Uh, now to describe uh, the methodology of our project, uh, project we have uh, this short video. Uh, in the beginning, we uh, in the beginning uh, we start with the measure the prevalence of the disease in the area. So we ask in uh, social media programs about the variety farms and backyard chickens in Hebron, and we prepared a survey to collect information about the. Uh, about the farms uh, and the type of uh, the farms type of chickens and numbers and uh, whether the chickens are vaccinated or not also we prepared a uh, form of consent of uh, consent to take approved uh, uh, from the farm owner uh, then we start to visit uh, these uh, farms uh, in the areas of uh, Hebron Tafuh Azahriya and Bani Naim and uh, we collect uh, blood samples for serological assay and uh, for molecular assay we take uh, swab samples and uh, uh, we take some chickens who have which have uh, symptoms of the disease for autopsy we take uh, uh, for the autopsy so we take a tissue from uh, uh, from the lung uh, from the lung trachea and kidney <coughs> Uh, now for uh, for the diagnosis for the serological test we choose uh, the ELISA test uh, enzyme linked immunosorbents assay uh, to de uh, to determine the uh, antibody titer in the serum so st we start with the dilution of the serum of uh, the serum uh, then we add uh, this uh, uh, diluted serum inside a wells which coated with IBV antigens and uh, then we make a washing for the uh, then we make a washing for uh, the plates uh, then add the conjugated antibodies after that we uh, we add uh, make another wash and add uh, the substrate and stop and uh, the stop solution uh, and to read the uh, and to read the uh, results we uh, read absorbance by ELISA reader and make some calculations to get the uh, ELISA uh, get the tighter value for the molecular test we first we extracted the uh, RNA materials uh, the RNA and convert the RNA to complementary DNA uh, then we make a nested PCR and uh, gel agarose gel electrophoresis 
the result, uh, the result of the, prevalent, uh, the prevalence IBV in Hebron, uh, we have uh, 15 positive samples, uh, positive samples from 16. Uh, these 16, uh, these 15 samples, uh, some of them as a result of vaccination, and the other unvaccinated chickens, uh, they uh, uh, supposed to be uh, infected in the past time. And uh, for the agarose gel, and for the agarose gel uh, test, we have uh, one chickens which infected with IBV. Uh, from these uh, results, and uh, after talking to many uh, to many farm owners and veterinar veterinarians, they stressed in the importance of vaccination against IBV uh, to avoid infection. Uh, so we talked with Dr. Hazem uh, Shower and approved in uh, uh, applied different uh, vaccination programs, different vaccination programs in two uh, chicken farms. Sabil and Hemsel. And uh, then we visit these farms and uh, know the uh, type of vaccine and uh, method of vaccination. The, this approved vaccination program, uh, the uh, vaccine by IBVAR2 uh, IB from Fibro Company, and uh, the method is uh, drinking water for Sabil's uh, farms, uh, for Sabil 1. لو سمحتي and Hemsa one uh, one dose and Hemsa two two doses in uh, two time the first time at day, day one uh, day ten and the second dose at day twenty five. But is not vaccination program. These girls reflect the result of vaccination program. farm and uh, Vertical axis reflect the antibody titer and the horizontal axis reflect the, the reflect the age of chickens. In uh, and the cutoff was uh, the cutoff was 80, uh, 8, 833. Uh, we have in Sabil's farms the uh, light, the light green uh, for uh, hence for Sabil one which vaccinated with one and half dose and uh, the dark green for Sabil two which vaccinated with uh, half, uh, two doses. And in the left, we have uh, we have uh, Hemsa, uh, the light uh, blue, which vaccinated with one uh, dose, and the uh, uh, light uh, the dark blue uh, uh, with one and a half dose. Uh, the they see before the vaccination, at day nine, uh, they uh, there is an amount of antibody titer. Uh, that means there is uh, there is. Uh, uh, there is a protection, some protection that's too little uh, from maternal antibody, then uh, continue to, decree, to, to decrease uh, uh, after after the uh, the first dose. There is no there is no uh, response from vaccination at day 19, and uh, there is some response at day 24. That's after uh, the first vaccination. So we uh, give a booster at day 25, and uh, we can compare the results at day uh, 36 and uh, or 35. Uh, for uh, so Sabil's farms, we can uh, see that that one and a half. Oh, one and a half dose was more effective than the than two doses. Uh, and uh, in uh, the left, uh, in the left, in Himsa, uh, the one and uh, one dose was more effective than two doses, but there is some uh, sampling uh, errors. In conclusion, uh, the value of maternal antibody does not provide adequate protection and has short longevity. The presence of maternal antibody delay the early response to vaccination, and the response began when the, when it is disappeared. The prime uh, dose of vaccine is not enough and needs, needs uh, to uh, be reinforced with a booster dose. Uh, also, a low uh, dose of vaccine does not provide sufficient protection against the virus, but the high dose re reduce, reduce the response. And therefore, it is uh, better to adopt an average dose. Finally, the IBV vaccination is indispensable, especially in commercial farms because uh, of high prevalence of the virus and this uh, danger to the polarity sector. Thank you for listening.
آه انهت ولا قطع النت ولا ايش بالضبط اه نهاية العرض اوكي آه طيب شكرا آه للمتحدثتين آه آه نفتح مجال هلا على ما يبدو اي بتعتذر او صار معها شيء تعذر عليها الوصول للمؤتمر او التحدث بنفتح الان مجال للنقاش دكتور شرف تفضل تدير جلسه النقاش يعني بدايه بنشكر المتحدثين على المعلومات القيمة اللي أعطونا إياها بخصوص يعني الدكتورة حنان ملكاوي of adaptation and diversity of microorganisms in harsh environments. so كنا بنعرف إحنا إنه لما يكون عندنا microorganism grow up in harsh environments they will earn adaptation for the new situations. وهذه مسألة خطيرة كثير يعني وخصوصا في المايكرو اورجانيزم لما نحن نتحدث عن في مجال الأدوية يعني في الأنتي بايوتكس سرعان ما إنه المايكرو اورجانيزمز ديفلوب نيو ميكانيزمز تو ريزيست ذا أنتي بايوتيك بالإضافة إلى بعد إذنك دكتور شرف بس نطلب من بشرة وهذا يعمل ستوب شير عشان نفتح مجال لكل الحضور أو أنت تنهي الشير اوكي ستوب شير من عندك اوكي شكرا سو اند اولسو ان ذيس سيشن ذير از ا ا جود اكزامبل اوف هارش انفايرمنتس ويتش از ان ووتر الكترولايتس يعني هاو Water electrolytes affects the mechanisms or microbial resistance, or how to enhance the immune system of microbial strains against the water additives to ensure food safety, water safety. So this is a good example, and also. In the last uh, talk about uh, comparison of antibodies titer following different vaccination schedules. So also this is another example of how to uh, increase the resistance or how the, uh, the viruses affect uh, the chicken in, uh, uh, in Hebron farms. So all of these uh, uh, branches of microbiology. So if anybody have an, any questions or Dr. Hanan, she, she can uh, enrichment also the, uh, the, our discussion. From the, the panelists or uh, the, 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 the attendees. Dr. Hanan, this one. Dr. سؤالي للدكتورة حنان عرض طيب ومميز لكن أنا ملاحظتش في العرض حديث يمكن أنا اضطريت أطلع علشان كان عندي امتحان لطالب غير مكتمل بس تعرفت إذا عرضت شيء ولا لا الحديث عن اللي هو الهالوفيلز يعني حسيتش إنه كان موجود في العرض خصوصا إنه يعني الأردن على البحر الميت ومن السهل جدا عزل كثير أنواع من البكتيريا زي الهالوبكتيريا مثل اليورانيوم على سبيل المثال في شيء آخر أو تساؤل آخر للدكتورة هل أثناء دراستكم للهارش كونديشنز درستوا تأثيرها على السكندري ميتابوليزم تبع الأورجانيزم أو فقط يعني شفتوا عمليات النمو تبعها وتأثيرها بدون ما تشوفوا تغييرات في الميتابولايت سيستم سبعيتها ولا لا؟ اوكي ثانك يو دكتور كمال فور يور كوشنز ريجاردينغ ذا ديد سي يس بيكوز اي واز نوت ايبل تو شو اول ماي بروجيكتس اي هاف دان ويز ماي ريسيرش تيم ان جوردان ا فيري نايس بروجيكت اباوت ذا هيلو فايلز ان ذا ديد سي And we were able to isolate a lot of uh, halotolerant bacteria in the Dead Sea. It's not just from the water in the Dead Sea, and also it's in the surrounding. 
even we have done some uh, studies on the uh, the plants, you know, tamarix plants that live, you know, these are like uh, plants that resist salt condition around the Dead Sea. They are like small shrubs. Yes, and and in fact, uh, uh, we 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 make a stock of these uh, cultures. Some of them are archaea and some are bacteria in uh, glycerol broth, you know, under minus 70, just for future, you know, uh, uh, useful applications. Uh, as for your uh, second question regarding the secondary metabolites or metabolism, yes, the EU project, uh, I don't know if you, uh, if you hear the slides that I was talking about the EU funded projects, which is about the diversity of microbes in the Mediterranean and Gulf of Aqaba. In fact, our colleagues from the European countries, yes, they did a lot of uh, metabolic, uh, or, or they studied the, they call it um, uh, metabolic uh, studies about the metabolites that were affected and they found really so many, so many interesting results. And if you are interested, I could provide you with some of the publications, in fact, uh, uh, about this issue. Great, Professor, because really I'm interested because my field sure. is biohydrogen and industrial biotechnology. Yeah, I will, inshallah. If you provide me in Khilal, Dr. Sharaf, about with your email, I will be more than willing to provide you with such studies. Yes. Sure. Thank you very much. طيب شكرا شكرا دكتور رحنان لإجابة السؤال شكرا لدكتور كمال في حدا تاني حابب يسأل أظن شايفة في عادل رفع إيده راح allow to talk اتفضل ولا هي دائما هيك الايد هاي كانت في حدا من المشاركين حابب يسال عن شيء او يستفسر عن شيء بعرفش اذا مبين معكم يا جماعه على الكيو اند اي كويستشنز ار بيتن استاذ عادل اه حملت له بعرفش جرب من عندك دكتور شرف عملت له الله وهذا بس هو عامل اصلا ميوت بس هو من اول رافع ايده فمش عارفه في حدا بيحب يستفسر عن ايه؟ مساء الخير اه تفضل <تصفيق> عرف عن حالك عادل السلايمه مدير مختبرات جوده المياه بلديه الخليل انا اعتذر فيش عندي اي مداخله ولا اي سؤال ال ربما يكون المشكلة من الكمبيوتر بضل يعمل ريز هان ايام سو سوري اوكي شكرا طيب طيب في حدا عنده اي سؤال طيب ما في اسئلة طيب نسال انا عندي سؤال بشرة وبنان يعني يعني الفيروس اللي انتم اشتغلتوا عليه الفيروس يعني هو سبيسيفيك فور تشيكن ولا ممكن يصيب يعني الهيومن فور اكزامبل الايفيدنس اللي عندكم يعني إثباتات يعني ليش ما هذا الفيروس وما بيصيبش الإنسان أو العكس أو لا هلا هو نبذ نتوك يعني لما عرضت في بس إنفكشن فروم شكن تشكن هلا هو نبذ نتوك يعني إنفكشن فروم شكن تشكن ما مش زنتك إنه ينتقل من الأنيمال للهيومن فهو بس مخصص للشكن وهو الأفيان أفيان إنفكشن برونكايتس هو بس للزواج يعني الاسترين بتاعته بس بتصيب الشكل ما بتصيب طيور كثير طيب طيب عاطف موجود معنا سمعنا عاطف عاطف زادي موجود معنا 
طيب طيب احنا تحت كل الظروف يعني اللي كان المفروض يدير هذه الجلسه الدكتور هلال زيد اللي هو عنده يعني كان بامكانه يبحر اكثر في هذا الموضوع ولكن لسبب او لاخر يعني هو يعني اعتذر او لم يستطيع الوصول اليه لذلك يعني باسم ابو بكر دكتور شرف رفع ايده والدكتور بسام الزين آه، اوكي ايش؟ اه اوكي بسام الزين بسام ابو بكر اوكي نعم مساء الخير للجميع مساء يمكن سؤالي بتعلق برضه بالفيروس تبع التشيكن وتكملة للدكتور شرف يعني انا يعني هل هم عملوا يعني اكزامينيشن للفيروس هل ممكن ينتقل عن طريق البيض قشر البيض تناول البيض من التشيكن للانسان ولا لا؟ ولا ما عمل ولا هي دراسات حتكون مكمله لهي الدراسه؟ هذا السؤال يعني. أه هلا احنا عارفين هو بما انه فيروس فهو سبيسيفيك لسبيشيز معين. دكتوره فيش شيء فيش شيء سبيسيفيك. دكتورة فيش إشي سبيسيفيك في علم الأحياء في الميكروبيولوجي فيش إشي سبيسيفيك يعني في دراسات مكملة يعني أنا بعرف هاي الفيروس كوفيد 19 هو مصمم للخفافيش الروايات تبعته مختلفة تماما ومتضاربة تماما فأنا يعني هل هو حيكون سبيسيفيك للتشيكن ولا ممكن ينتقل من الانيمالز دل للهيومن بيين هلا هو بناء على دراس دراسات انه هو بس سبيسيفيك للتشيكن وما بصيب الانسان طبعا دراسات موجوده انه هو نات زونتي اوكي يا دكتور اوكي تحياتي طيب في عندنا كمان مين رافع ايده بسام او بكر اوكي في بروف بسام الزين معنا من البانلست تم تم الان كان معنا دكتور السلام عليكم السلام آه. عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله اوكي سؤالي للدكتور حنان ملكاوي اذا في ذيرز اكسبيرمنتس اور بروجيكتس هاف دن تو ذا يوزنج ثيرموفايلز لايك اكستريم ثيرموفايلز ان ويست ووتر تريتمنت Because uh, uh, in my master degree in King Fahd University in Petroleum at Petroleum uh, at King Fahd University uh, and mineral uh, petroleum and minerals in Saudi Arabia, I have done uh, a project with my professor. We have uh, uh, good results uh, in uh, using thermophiles in wastewater treatment instead of mesophiles. I don't know if uh, if he has some projects. Uh, regarding this uh, very important field in our life. Okay, Dr. Bassam, thank you for question. Yes, if you notice my last slide or uh, the slide before the last slide maybe about the useful applications of, of extremophiles, one of them were about the thermophiles and it has a lot of applications among which in fact is in the waste uh, treatment. Uh, as for my projects, I have not tested these thermophiles against waste treatment, but for the project of oil bioremediation, uh, believe it or not, one of these uh, hydrocarbon degraders, in fact, consortia, because there were like six uh, bacterial isolates that were very efficient in hydrocarbon degradation, which is in the crude oil. So we just like, I, I told one of my students, she's from Algeria, she was a graduate student. I said, Linda, what, what do you think if we try this on waste with our treatment? If they could clean, you know, the waste that is in the wastewater because some of the uh, components in the wastewater could be hydrocarbons or other pollutants. And in fact, to our surprise, uh, three of these isolates have some potential in cleaning wastewater. Uh, 
So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you raised this question because we cannot, you know, uh, speak about all the results or all the projects that we have. But yes, thermophiles could have, because, you know, their enzymes are stable at high temperature. So yes, they could be used, why not? But for my project, I have not tested these thermophiles. I tested the uh, oil bio re remediator organisms. Um, I hope that I answer your question, Victor. Thank you very much, Victor. Mm -hmm. شكرا دكتور حنان شكرا دكتور بسام في اي اسئله ثانيه اخرى اي مداخله I have a questions for uh, Mr. Atif I cannot understand uh, the mechanism of iron how can uh, enhance the immune system of microorganism that he has tested if you can clarify this, uh, Mr. Atif, the effects of iron on, on the immune system or uh, the ability of microorganisms in drinking water, how they can escape the chlorine or another uh, water detergents, let's say, uh, in uh, municipal water. Okay, we'll answer uh, the question. Uh, iron have, uh, have a vital role in the phenytoin reaction. Phenytoin reaction is uh, a vital reaction in the production of reactive oxygen species uh, by convert the hydrogen peroxide to OH. This OH have many negative effects on the uh, macromolecules on the bacterial cells, such as DNA mutation. This mutation may be corrected uh, falsely, uh, this mutation may be lead to new traits in the bacteria, such as antibiotic resistance. This is the first one. The, fir uh, the second one, uh, the second uh, reason, membrane lipid peroxidation. Here, this peroxidation may be impairing or imbalance the membrane permeability, can, be, can maybe lead to reduce the membrane permeability and uh, give the bacteria a new trait uh, by uh, prevent uh, antibiotics to enter the cell. Okay, finally, uh, cysteine and methionine uh, residual secretion. This amino acid had, uh, has a thiol group, the Maran SH group. Uh, it has a vital role in the formation of uh, intra and inter SS bond. This bond has a vital role also in the formation and uh, configuration of a protein. So, formation of a new SS bond uh, inside the protein uh, may be lead to change the conformation of uh, protein and, conform and the change the uh, Activity and uh, the activity and function of the protein may be lead, may be lead to new traits such as antibiotic resistance. This is uh, the effect of, a, uh, of iron on the bacterial cell. Okay, thank you, Mr. Atif. Okay. If the, uh, anybody else has uh, uh, questions, no one raising the hand or anyone. Fi uh, hada min panelist. Uh, Dr. Ayman? Naam. Inta rafi' idak? La, 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 mish rafi'. Huwa fi arba' khamsa min tihnin shakhsiyyati. Hada ishi khatir. Hada ma'am. Sahih fi arba' khamsa sahih bi ism hadritak. Taib, illi kan rafi' ismo bi ido bi ism Dr. Ayman. وانا عملت له لور هاند في حدا بيحب يسال سؤال؟ ماجد الخمسيه جامعه بيت لحم بس حطيت بالتشات مرجع وفي مراجع اخرى لها علاقه بالبكتيريا ميتا بار كودينج لانه ممكن تستعمل يا دكتور حنان مور ديفرنت برايمرز حتى تطلع مور ذان ذا باسيلس Yes, that's true. Thank you. Shukran, shukran, Dr. Mazen. Dr. Agadir, do هيك بيكون السكيديول تبعنا رجع تظبط نعم نعم 
اوكي بس احنا هلا بصراحه الساعه كم اه يعني احنا يا دوبك ناخذ خمس دقائق بريك فما بعرف خلوا نعم. خمس دقائق ولا نعم هو حتى انا بقول يعني نبدا على طول بس خمس دقائق كفايه كفايه خمس دقائق نعم يعني نبدا نبدأ الا ربع طيب نبدا الا ربع ماشي تمام نعم. عشان تو جو باك تو سكادول خلينا عشان هيك نعتذر من طبعا من ال السبيكرز اللي هلا بدنا نحولهم اتنديز ونحول السبيكرز في السيشن الثانيه الى بانلز تمام شكرا نعم. للجميع شكرا دكتور احنا شكرا دكتور عاطف ما نسكر الميتنج ما نسكر الميتنج خليه بس انه نعمل الميوت لا لا انا حتى لو انا طلعت ما بيسكر دكتور شرف الميتنج ما راح اسكره بس بدنا نعمل عمليه تحويل نخفف من البانلز نحولهم لاتنديز والاتنديز اللي عندهم توكس آه ما بعرف زي ما بدك بدك تخليهم زي ما بدك ماشي اللي بحب هلا يعمل بريك احنا نرتب امورنا الحضور المشاركين معنا انا رح احول كل اللي موجودين معنا بانلست اللي لهم توكس الى اتنديز عشان نخفف على الضغط على الهاي وبعدين المشاركين في السيشن الثاني اللي هو طبعا الشيرمان الى دكتور شرف على البانلست دكتور أيمن في ناس داخلين باسمك عم بحاول أعملهم تشينج رول تو أتندي مش عم بزبط معي
طيب لو سمحتوا المتحدثين في الجزء الثاني اللي موجود يرفع لي ايده اذا ممكن عشان احوله لبانلست اللي يقدر يعمل شير سكرين لهذا احمد اوكي اوكي دكتور احمد صرت انت بانلست صح؟ اي صحيح اوكي تمام بس نبتدي يجي موعد البرزنتيشن بعد اذنك يعني بنلتزم بالوقت 10 دقائق وبتفتح كاميرا بعد اذنك تمام؟ اوكي تمام شكرا شكرا لك دكتور كريستيان دكتور تريسين هلو اوكي ويلكم اتس اور بليجر تو بي ويز اس اوكي سون يور توك ويل ستارت اند دكتور شرف ويل انتروديوس يو اوكي ثانك يو Yes, but we, we still need the other uh, speakers to be uh, oh, okay. with us. Aisha? I, uh, Aisha, she, she is out. Ahmed, Ahmed, Ahmed. Ahmed, 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 لا لا هدير 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 اه موجود دكتور مازن في دكتور مازن رافع ايده اه دكتور مازن تفضل هدير موجودة هدير موجودة وينها؟ اه اديتها انا بروموت تو بانلست بس مش عارف اذا موجودة حولتها لبانلست؟ اه بس توافق عليها هي وهي في دكتور في دكتور مازن رافع ايده ابو عمر جوزيف انا في مجموعه بس ان شاء الله بس يقبلوا اذا ما زبطوا بعينك انا دكتوره بتغير من عندي ااا معك ايمن الحقيقي مين هذا وين ااا امل ابو رميلي انا 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 من الاكاديميه اه وين علي لون برداني ااا ولا البنفسجيه أنا مش شايف إشي أنا مش شايف إشي طيب أوكي ححولك بانيليست أعرفش إذا أنت ولا لا وكيف حكيت إذا أنت مش بانيليست <تصفيق> بعت لك تشات آه آه صح <تصفيق> ما أنا سمعتك دكتور عملت أنموت آه آه أوكي بعرفش أنا هي الاثنين أي أنا... أي أشواق موجودة أشواق وينها؟ هي رافعة إيدها أشواق، وين رافعة إيدها أشواق؟ مش شايف. جوز داخلة باسمي أشواق. أكيد أكيد دكتور باسم الدكتور أيمن. طب كيف ما نعرف إحنا هيك؟ تبعت رسالة، ما عندي رسالة، بغير اسم بغير اسمها، بس دخل بغير أسماء دخلي. السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. آه. أشواق. افتح هاي اشواق اشواق اسم ايمن هاي داخلي يلا كويس لما تفتح الكاميرا بتشوفيها من غير اسمها اوكي ماشي انا ريني املى اسمك يا اشواق اشواق هلا عندك ثلاث نقاط فوق عند اسمك يس يس اي فاوند ات سوري هدير السلام عليكم يعطيك العافيه دكتور Why this is happening? Ah, ah, okay, okay. But if you heard it, you're like you opened it. It's right. I'm opening it from the wall and the laptop. No, you have to remove one because it's doing a noise and a headache. And when you start to do the wall, I'm fine. I'm opening the wall. اوكي وبس تبلش محادثتك بعد اذنك تفتح الكاميرا وطبعا زي ما مكتوب في السكادول بدك تلتزمي 10 دقائق 
وطبعا راح نحول الاسئله للاخر عشان ما يصير في خربشه في السكيدول تمام اوكي في غزلان 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 اه غزلان موجود هو ممكن متاخر يمكن يفوت متاخر هو هو الاحسن لازم يكونوا موجودين ما انا عارفه بس شو عمل في غزلان وفي عبد الله ابو زينه لا مش موجود مش موجود عبد الله وفي لين لين كاني شفت لين بس لين عرفه هي نفسها لين عرفه انت نفسك لين الماضي لا مش نفس ها مش نفس في مازن دكتور مازن بروموت تو بانيلست هيو مش ضابط دكتور شرف مش ضابط عندي تحويل دكتور مازن مره ثانيه لبانيلست اه هيو تحول اوكي دكتور خلينا نبدا مع الدكتوره كريستين اه صحيح واللي بيحضر بنلحقه فيهم ما احنا موجودين ماشي دكتور شرف تفضل اتس يور سيشن I have uh, uh, good afternoon to everybody. We are welcoming Dr. Christina Kochendorf from uh, Germany. And uh, to be, it's our pleasure to invite you as a keynote sp speaker in our conference uh, uh, organized by the uh, Palestinian Society for Biological Sciences with uh, coordination with Palestinian Academy for Science and Technology. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Christina is a researcher and a projects coordinator at the Institute of Bio and Geosciences, IPG2, at Fronsintrom Jolish in Germany. Uh, uh, having graduated with uh, geobotany and computer science and started out in a joint field projects in China and Jolish and later in Montpellier, France, with the main topics of plant nutrition and resilience against flooding and other stress. Since 2030, back in Yolish, algae were here focus, first with assessment of the added value chains of microalgal micro lipids productions to jet fuels, etc. And in during, in, since to, uh, to uh, 2016 with a coordination with the IBG2 Algae Science Center with three pilot scale algae protection facilities, control and study of microalgae productivity and the growth dynamics in large volume cultures have since then been a major topic. The ultimate target is to simplify algal carbon dioxide sequestering for rather accessibility and better connectivity into industry, agriculture, and city environments towards autonomous intelligence algae culture control and the technical implementation of modern bioeconomy. Last but not least, focus is the usage of algae in plant nutrition, especially the possible benefits of algae of algal biomass and other organic fertilizers to an improvement of poor soils and nutrient cycle, always aiming to keep science applicable and working towards circular bioeconomy. Uh, here talk will be enabling an intelligent, sustainable, and future-oriented bioeconomy from problematic wastewater to circular water management with the help of algae. So, Dr. Christina, it's our pleasure to hear you, and you are, it's your turn now. You are welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not know how short or long the information had to be. <laughs> can you tell me if you can see my screen? Can you see the presentation? Yes, we, okay. Okay, then I'm going to start. So my aim today is, uh, give me a second, give me a second. Uh, 
So uh, my aim today is actually to provide uh, an overview about uh, some of the uses of algae biomass uh, in economic and uh, possibly bioeconomic processes, and also give some uh, motivation about uh, connectable bioeconomic, uh, bioeconomic solutions and uh, why or how to push uh, their implementation in the future, and why this is not only important uh, for people in Germany, but it is really a worldwide challenge uh, where everybody can really profit from everybody else's experiences. So uh, what is by, uh, by economy uh, seen as actually? So it's a production and the use of biological resources to produce uh, products uh, also for processes and services in a biological way. It goes towards a resource and climate friendly lifestyle and work and towards closed substance and cycle waste um, management. Uh, for Germany, that means that there was a decision of the German government to withdraw from uh, coal-fired power generation until 2038, and uh, also the general fight against the ramifications of climate change, and therefore large parts of the Federal Republic of Germany are now confronted with the need for structural changes that affects many areas of uh, daily life and pose some major challenges for the people that live there. For example, the people that lived around the great lignite plants. Um, but this also offers an enormous opportunity to bring about a rethink in uh, our fossil carbon-based economy uh, towards another economy which is based on uh, bioeconomic principles. Um, an additional motivation is, of course, the climate change effects. So uh, people here right now are maybe thinking, yeah, why is Europe worrying about uh, water? Um, but this is still a joint motivation to better deal uh, with this resource. Because even in Germany, we are feeling that in the last three years, we had 24 months, which were far too dry. We only had 11 months, which were too wet and which were not at the right time for crops. So we have had quite an experience about what it means to not have enough water for our normal crops. And um, if the world average temperature continues rising, uh, our areas even might experience like 10 year droughts. Um, yeah, we are not used to this, so it is a bit scary. Um, well, uh, so why there is something like further biological wastewater treatment, which you have seen on the uh, starter slide, maybe important. There is the question of uh, uh, the additional question of nutrient reuse, especially of phosphorus, during this water providing question. Um, water is already an endangered commodity in uh, many regions of Europe, as you've seen here, and uh, will even be more under stress uh, in the future, also worldwide. And uh, there is a motivation here that we share also with our current Palestinian partners here, and it's not just a commodity, it is really valuable. And uh, the nutrients which are maybe in there are also valuable. They can be or there were and maybe can be again fertilizers to ensure uh, crop growth, which goes especially for phosphorus and for nitrogen. And uh, why, for example, nitrogen compounds are not scarce, but rather subject to accumulation at the wrong place and the wrong time, for example, in the water, causing eutrophication and posing a danger to water ecology and health. Um, on the other hand, then the phosphorus is a different matter and uh, for both, a circular use, use has many benefits. Um, as for phosphorus, um, phosphorus distribution worldwide is relatively inhomogeneous, and uh, the loss of both phosphorus and nutrient to the water causes eutrophication in water bodies, and the existing wastewater streams contain lots of phosphorus and nitrogen residue. So uh, being able to close these nutrient cycles also has a matter of being locally more independent of global movements of nutrients uh, or water. So this is, of course, also something which is interesting. The natural cycle of phosphorus, for example, takes about 400,000 years, which is an additional um, motivation uh, to uh, have this uh, this this um, uh, impending boom of not, maybe at some point not enough fertilizer uh, gone from over our heads. So uh, the intelligent and sustainable uh, water and resource man uh, management and handling is urgently needed. 
This does not just go for agriculture, but also, for example, for cities or urban areas with their water flows and nutrient cycles. These are also sources of uh, treated water and nutrients and can even be seen as production units in this regard. And at present, uh, used and nutrient containing water is either just discarded or maybe disposed to wastewater treatment. And uh, techniques to regain the nutrients here are needed or need to be subject to improvement because they are by far not uh, perfect yet. So these could be enhanced by additional treatments like biological bacteria or algae nutrient uptake. We have even heard about it already today. Um, and this does not necessarily even have to happen in the wastewater treatment plants, but there can be even more local solutions, uh, especially directly connected to agricultural processes. So the target is in the future at some point a true nutrient cycle, especially for phosphorus to have more independent resources. So here's an, a picture of this nutrient cycle. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, I hope so. Um, you can see there is on the left side, there is a rather large arrow of phosphorus, which is mined going in. And there are still losses of phosphorus during the use in agriculture, in food and feed and production, where phosphorus ends up in fixed forms in the soil and is not useful anymore. Or where phosphorus is lost into landfills and rivers, where it can even be harmful in non-wanted algae blooms uh, for eutrophication processes. At the same time, I just said the word algae blooms, they thrive on this kind of nutrient loss. Algae could, for example, be used to get this stuff back into the cycle. And I will elaborate a little bit further on this on the next slides. So algae as a green resource. We have already heard a lot of bacteria there, but algae are also kind of quite interesting um, species in this regard. Um, our actual mineral oil reserves consist largely of very old algae whose biomass has conserved sunlight energy throughout the Earth history. And under optimum circumstances, they would be able to grow 10 to 40 times faster than higher plants. Careful, that's a laboratory value. But they are still growing quite quickly also under normal circumstances. Uh, several pretty names. And so far, there are more than estimated 200,000 species out there. But only about 100 are right now exploited worldwide. And uh, almost none of them are somehow genetically modified. So people are still working with wild types, which also underlines the potential that these species in theory can have. And of course, they are able to use uh, sunlight for phototrophic growth and nutrient uptake. And they can so uh, therefore also be carbon sequestration thrown in into the mix of uses which this biomass has. So there are still some questions needed for applications where you want to use algae. Like, will they be able to live where they are supposed to work? How weather dependent is the, is the process? Since uh, sunlight and CO2 should be used as an energy source to make it even more sustainable. Um, this is actually more critical question for Germany because anybody who has already been to Germany knows that uh, weather is kind of our most chaotic parameter which we have. Um, how productive could the algae then be in any given environment? You need some uh, measure to give this. And uh, these are, for example, questions that are uh, being solved at IBG2 at the current time. Another question is, of course, uh, additional value from this biomass because they can produce different kinds of lipids, contain different forms of uh, sugars, uh, lignite, etc., which are higher, which or pigments, which can be higher value products, uh, which could form additional value chain processes. But this is today not part of this uh, presentation. If you are interested, interested in this, I would ask you to contact me afterwards. So we have, uh, I have some pictures, uh, so yet you can imagine how algae are worked with and presented today. Um, for example, in fermenters, which is not interesting so far because we want to do uh, phototrophic things and it's too dark in there and they have to be fed with sugar, which causes an additional use of agricultural land. We do not want this, but it is done and it is efficient if you want to produce certain products. Uh, then there are these so-called open pond uh, productions, uh, for example, on Hawaii or even in uh, Israel, where they are using salt water and sometimes fresh water cultures. This is the uh, cheapest and most widely used uh, way to produce algae in a certain climate zone. So in uh, 
Our areas we need more uh, in Germany we need more controlled systems, for example in tubes or in bags, which can look like this, uh, and sometimes even in greenhouses. So um, currently use of microalgae, just as a general overview, because I will concentrate on the agricultural uh, aspects later. Uh, algae can be used as food additives or colorants, even go into pharma and nutri nutritional uh, products from shampoo to uh, um, spirulina as a health booster for you. They can be used for fish feeds. Uh, they can be used in theory for biomass and biofuels. Um, for this, the value chains are established, uh, but as long as oil is too cheap, this is far too expensive, for example. And they can also be used in wastewater treatment and nutrient cycling. This is where we are going. Um, just a side note, if algae are produced in freshwater, there's a very simple connection to have them later used in uh, wastewater treatment because there are no disposal conflicts. We do not want more salt than needed on any agricultural used field or any other substrate for plants. But salt water normally makes it more easy to cultivate them as, as a bit less maintenance. And we have, but we have seen in the past, it much also depends on having the right species, which very often are just local species of algae which live in your surrounding anywhere. They know the pathogens. Um, we do not even have to be too specific. And then there are some projects, uh, some products like uh, some sweets, which use it as colorants, some food additives, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, some animal fodder, and also here for fertilizing and uh, nutrients recycling and nutrient uptake from uh, wastewater, as you can uh, see in the corner. So, um, some information about uh, how to actually grow them. So we have gained some experiences in algae production on larger scale over the years at Jülich. You can see some type of photobioreactors here on this slide, uh, some outdoor photobioreactors on the lower uh, left, uh, which can be even heated or cooled, of course, take some energy. Uh, we have a greenhouse where we can produce algae. And um, if you have them in the greenhouse, you would, for example, centrifuge them to get a nice creamy mass of algae. Then you go and put them into a spray dryer or a solar dryer. And when you want to put them into a soil, you can do this in a powdered formulation or even in a wet formulation, depending on what your target is there. So what can one produce in a location like ours uh, per year? Um, we have finally met after some years of running in an average yearly production of about 73 tons per hectare in year. Just for comparison, a uh, Hawaii algae plant would after my knowledge, produce around 30 tons per hectare in year. Um, but it's an open, this was the open pond, which are generally a bit less productive, but it's a run in production, which is also very reliable. So um, what can this biomass then in our wishes be used for? We have done some preliminary experiments a few years prior, where we have compared mineral uh, fertilizer, just a normal NPK fertilizer. We have used algae biomass, and as comparison, there is a non-fertilized wheat plant here um, to see if nutrients can actively be transferred from the algae through the soil to the plant. And the answer was, yes, it works. Um, and an additional uh, bonus is, of course, that algae contain not just nutrients, but also carbon and other maybe beneficial components uh, to enhance and boost the soil microbiota, which is also not researched very well yet in this regard. So this was a very interesting uh, way to take this further. Click. Here is something which uh, part of which can actually also be seen in the Natural Museum at uh, Bethlehem. It's the so-called algae turf scrubber. And this is where algae are used for uh, production of cleaner water, where you actually rinse the water over a pathway, um, which can be, this is an example, which can be much longer than this one uh, and have better effect even. And the algae take up the nutrients from the water and the product is uh, first clean water. And when they have grown enough, you can harvest the algae biomass, which gives this nice green sludge. And this could then, for example, further, further be used uh, as a fertilizer. Um, you can ask, for example, Professor Arafi uh, or Maisen Kumsi, who is also speaking here later about this because there is an installation about it. And uh, this kind of system, for example, can put into use almost everywhere where there are nutrient-rich water. So this is a relatively flexible process. Um, so this is so very applicable for us. 
Um, another challenge is that we are able to uh, produce um, all around the year because, of course, algae have a fav favorable light and also a favorable temperature regime. It's, for example, you can see the changes in light throughout the years, which is the yellow uh, line, and all the changes in temperature throughout the years. And these are all the uh, average temperatures in this case. And the algae would actually prefer it almost always a little bit brighter and a little bit warmer than uh, Germany has to offer. Um, so this is a kind of, uh, um, how do you say, uh, if you get if you are getting interested, you have you would have the place to go. <laughs> so the algae biomass, uh, which you can be obtained there, can uh, incidentally very easily be applied uh, to fields instead of uh, mineral fertilizers, and we believe that a very good contribution to nutrient cycling is possible here. It is not only about uh, the fertilizer and nutrient transfer, though. It is also um, about uh, the carbon transfer, the improvement of the soil and about using the best suited resilient plant species. Um, there will be actually more talks following in this session uh, afterwards. Um, it is also about other alternative fertilizing techniques which bring back carbon and nutrients to the soil and which may be able to improve depleted or desertificated substrates to make them uh, usable for agriculture. Uh, all this still in a resource optimizing way uh, towards the circular economy or here even. Bioeconomy. So these pictures, for example, are from when we tried out some uh, formulations of algae. Here's something with wet algae. And if you do not really take into account the property of your soil, for example, you can end up in a very fine sandy soil, which is very dry in the beginning, that it will not take up very well this fertilizing solution. If the soil would have been more wet, it would have been easier. So there are many things to learn, and there's also many things to learn from people who are much closer than agriculture, uh, than to agriculture than we as scientists actually are. So there is also a, a kind of uh, feedback and a kind of networking needed in the way to a uh, bioeconomy, to a circular bioeconomy, um, which cannot be done alone by a single group. In this. So, um, what we are doing right now in the framework, for example, of the Palestinian German Science Bridge and also in the base of uh, a project we have had in the Palgia framework is we are now targeting marginal fields experiments where right now two PhD students have started in Jülich to work on uh, the question of nutrient transfer and soil improvement by different organic fertilizers. This includes the algae, but this also includes, for example, the combination with biochars and residues from biogas facilities. Uh, and uh, we are very interested uh, in the dynamics and the transfer of nutrients, which turns out here, and also about the development of the soil in this regard. We have a chance to use relatively uh, empty soils, which are very young and have not been uh, used agriculturally before. Uh, in the uh, history after, the lignite uh, mining, which has been done in our area. So we have, uh, we are very looking forward to dig deeper into these questions. So, um, so the game is here uh, targeted against uh, soil amelioration and clearing up the uh, mechanisms behind it and also finding the best way of application because in what we have been, uh, been doing already, we have found, for example, that the timing of fertilization can be uh, very important. And of course, also the plant species, because not all of them uh, have maybe the right technique to taking up nutrients. What happens in the rhizosphere, uh, which is the zone where the plant connects with the soil, uh, can be very different depending on the plant species. So each plant has a different uh, uh, plan how to take up nutrients best, which can be changed up to an extent, but uh, not uh, in, in every direction and not in a, in a wide range for every plant. So um, every soil, every treatment, every plant can have the need of a tailored process where there is much to be learned. Um, in traditional agriculture, very much is already learned from experience from the crops which have been used for a long time. And uh, we are uh, learning from that experience, but uh, with this uh, new soil boosters, which I like to call them, we will have to uh, compare and to try to also learn the new things there. So, but can things like this be uh, the one solution? 
No, but it can make lots of motivation in many places for many part solutions. Um, now I'm getting a bit more general again, because what you here see is a picture of uh, three cycles in some urban environment and the resources which can be found there. They can also be found in smaller scale in a house or in a farm. I just chose this as an example because everything is on here. So there is uh, some motivation, which is also for the young people to get into motion and realizing these things. One could view uh, three resource areas, which do not yet overlap very much. So right now there is a part with uh, energy and heat, where there are some uh, resource oriented processes, like you can use photovoltaics, solar thermals, pellet heating, all of this is rather investment high. Uh, so there's relatively high cost. If you go to industry, uh, some things can be connected, like reuse of heat for uh, urban settlements, for example. Then you can go on the blue side to the waste and process water, um, where you can have, for example, connection to biogas, or uh, you can separate wastewater from a toilet into the yellow water part and the black water part. That is, uh, that is how it is called, for example, the urine, the ammonia rich part, and the uh, uh, the biomass rich part and then use this further to avoid too much load for the wastewater. You can even use rainwater usage because depending on the area, rainwater can be when in an area where there's much traffic relatively nitrogen rich and can also be used then in the in the runoff and you could also retrieve nutrients from there. A relatively small part is the uh, biomass circuit, which actually should also be green, but for some reason it's brown. Maybe it has already fermented, I'm not sure. Um, and for example, for biomass, there are larger solutions like uh, sewage treatment or uh, sewage, sewage sludge treatment or biogas plants. There are not so many local solutions yet, but in theory, it would be possible to have, for example, for a city quarter, a very small biogas plant or for a farm to have a very local, very small uh, biogas usage, which can produce digestate and produce some gas to heat a stove or something. So there are some innovative ideas. But there are not so many of those realized yet. And there is not the one big solution like finding the one biomass which can solve all our energy and uh, food problems. But the future solution will be complex and will be like a puzzle put together from all directions and be very much networking and connecting different resources. Um, in addition, all these, uh, we have now a lot of progress uh, made in machine learning and in connecting different processes. And this will also help a lot to more intelligi intelligent, intelligently uh, combine these kinds of processes to get them the most effective. The thing is that all starts on a small scale. There are lots of students actually having very good ideas and trying to set them uh, into motion within these kind of frameworks and the resources which they are possible. Um, but to find out, uh, so there need to be initiatives on, on many scales to learn about the right magnitudes and to reach efficiency and to overthink the infrastructure, which is where you actually are. Um, right now, then very much many places, it accepts too many losses to enable a true circular economy. So we need to catch those losses. Um, I have an example uh, on the next slide. For example, from 100 square meter roof area, if you were in Germany, uh, which could deliver electric energy uh, during the during the year, uh, year of 8,000 kilowatt hours, it could deliver solar heat uh, for about 30% of the total need of heating, which you would need in Germany, it can deliver about 160 cubic meter of water per year. But it could also be an area to produce uh, algae biomass of about 30 tons per hectare per year with 500 liter per square meter water for irrigation or gray water use, for example, for washing dishes or washing clothes. So this could be a balance uh, where one could start up if I have this balance. OK, where could I connect? Uh, where can I connect to which new systems where I could find an intelligent solution? What could I what is not yet used? What what is lost? Because right mm -hmm. now. What is lost more, most is heat, drinking Christina. water, and biomass. Christina. I'm sorry. <laughs> Try to finish because... Yeah. Especially uh, biomass and nutrients are lost very easily. Uh, also for this, uh, I recommend for uh, very good ideas uh, to visit the uh, Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability because I've had the chance and it was really good. And uh, 
for, for example, some ideas which students have had in Germany in the last year, um, there was a kind of competition where they tried to, uh, to get greener ideas. For example, one, one solution was here, the Loopside project is supposed to connect uh, water uses intelligently in an internet of things over a whole city to see where things are lost and where they could be used otherwise, just to get an information base. And there is this urban pergola, which just is supposed to bring more green and more shade and easier climatizing. And then there are uh, waste to resource unit, which, for example, can use uh, um, biological waste or coffee residue and uh, get back uh, substances of value for it. And there were some nice uh, ideas for this. So I hope uh, I can motivate now some of the listeners to pursue, maybe not exactly those, but similar solutions in these fields in the future. Because if more people do it, it gets easier, it gets more affordable, and the knowledge share is improving. We have social medias, so we can talk much more easy than years ago. So let's network, let's learn from each other and build a more sustainable bioeconomy everywhere possible. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, if there are questions, by a way of contact me later, I would be happy to. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, we can, if, if there is uh, a quick questions from, okay, Dr. Dr. Hanan. Dr. Okay. Hanan. Yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Christina. I mean, this is really, I really enjoyed your presentation and it's a very important topic indeed. Uh, I have a question for you. You know, with the, with the C2, CO2 emission uh, and the climate uh, change, uh, as you know, it's really one of the most, or maybe it's the, the most important crisis nowadays and, and not just currently, it's in the future. So how microalgae, you know, and with their capturing of CO2 and fixation of CO2, do you think this could help? Uh, for for, in, for the climate change problem and, and how even climate change affect these microalgae? Thank you, Christina. Um, thank you for the question. I think uh, the crucial word in here is help um, because uh, microalgae will not be the solution for CO2 neutral products. The uh, photosynthesis is not a total efficient, uh, a very efficient process in that regard. Um, which is okay, it happens everywhere in the world. This is our only natural uh, fixation process right now. Um, but uh, if you have to employ algae, you also have to use some pumps normally. You have to give them CO2 by bubbling. You will have uh, some loss through the surfaces. And um, if you produce a kilogram of algae, you will use for that two, between two and four kilograms uh, of CO2. Um, so yes, they fixate CO2. The thing is that uh, the processes in which they do that uh, also produce CO2 and they are not good enough yet. Um, especially when you have to use uh, harvesting techniques like centrifugation. So for sure, these are processes which can help towards a better CO2 balance. Uh, and there are processes envisionable where this is uh, actually a positive balance. We have, for example, have now some experiment, uh, some experiments done with a so-called CO2 concentrator, which is a machine which concentrates CO2 from the air and then pumps it through the algae, mm. which also works and can, for example, be uh, solar powered. But it is not a, a generally usable uh, technique, technique yet. So, of course, this is biomass, which is produced uh, uh, by using up CO2, but the surrounding uh, work is uh, depending on the product that you want, um, it needs more development. So what is re working relatively well are these so-called uh, turf scrubbers because they, they do not need additional CO2. So there's no additional uh, uh, loss in, in also not in the air by bubbling, but uh, uh, they take up just up the, the air CO2 in where they are, they are easy to harvest. So this is for example, yeah. uh, an uh. easier step. Dr. Christina, thank you very much, and we look forward to have much more cooperation between us and 
So we, 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 will, we will have a general discussion at the end of the session. So please um, be around everybody uh, at the end of the sessions. Type. Um, um, we can move now for the second speakers in this uh, plant biology sessions. Uh, Ahmed Al Burai. Ahmed Al Burai uh, holds a master's degree in agriculture biotechnology from Osman Ghazi uh, University in 2021 and a bachelor's degree in biotechnology from Ada Islamic University of Gaza to 2015. He worked at the Ministry of Agriculture and as a teacher assistant at Islamic University of Gaza. He also engaged in the water and agriculture related issues and take the position of a blue peace facilitator in the World Youth for Parliament for Water and theme coordinator at Mediterranean Youth for Water Network. Ahmad Al Burai, he is going to represent his presentation about the agri nanotechnology in Palestine challenges and perspectives. So, Ahmed, are you are, uh, here? You can start now. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, for the introduction. And I also would like to thank you, my colleagues, Mahmoud Hamou and Hassan Matar, for this uh, work with, from different background. We have established this one with uh, nanobiotechnology and agriculture biotechnology, and also from water treatment. Uh, these are our background that we have came from and we have engaged in this work and I would like to share this on behalf of my colleague. So as we know that the agriculture knows that the background, uh, the backbone for all the support system and uh, merely in the developing countries, but we can find that Palestine has a special issue since they are occupied and they are related in located in the Mediterranean Sea, but they have a limited uh, water resource, water and land resource that go due to the ongoing Israel occupation policy and the climate change that have been affected on the uh, agriculture sector and lead to the decline on the production and the yield. We can find that, uh, that during the last uh, report and the strategy that the Ag Ministry of Agriculture has held, in 2017-2022, they are uh, starting to work on more initiative and sustainable solution, and they are working to uh, improve uh, the effect, improve and uh, they are working to decline the effect uh, of this change on the land. So we found that nanotechnology could be a new technology that can help the plant uh, health. So with this uh, technology, we can increase the yield and reduce the minimize the nutrition loss in the fertilizer and also uh, we can control the pest and the nutrient management uh, in the future so with the objective of nanotechnology in the agriculture we can increase the yield and also re reduce the waste and nutrition loss near it to zero so we can increase the efficiency on the uh, agriculture sector but still, this technology needs new development and also still under uh, development and need more uh, technology to be implemented so we can use it for large and improve the economic for it. But so uh, it is still possible improving these technical uh, tools is very important and will be critical in the future. So in this uh, graph, we can see that the nanotechnology in agriculture can be uh, sorted in different level and we can find the category for these. Most of these would be related for apoiotic and biotic stress that can affect the plant and the other will be, uh, we can sort them like this. Some of these will be related for the soil, which we can also enhance the soil enhancement by nanomaterials. And the nano fertilizer can also improve the crop growth by uh, increase the absorption of the nutrient. And also in the molecular level, we can improve this by uh, have a good uh, and improved uh, species from plant that can be tolerance for the 
uh, stress that can affect them. And for the uh, control and the biocontrol for the uh, pesticide, pes the nano uh, pesticides can be used to protect the crop. And for the technology in general, we can find that the nano sensors can give us all the information we can find and monitor the plant during the situation if there are any, any increase on the pH or temperature or even for the need for water. And in the salt stress also, which can be a stress tolerance, which can be from different uh, reasons like cold, or for example, the increase of the UV that can affect the plant and uh, increase the production in the plant, which can be a harmful effect on the plant. So this is the main idea. Uh, methods can be nanotechnology used in agriculture. And the last, in uh, ISSW science, in the last uh, years, we can find that the number of nanotechnology agriculture uh, articles have been published, which are around like 700 uh, articles per year. Uh, which represent about 0.5% uh, of all the articles have been published in the agriculture in general. So this is still uh, uh, still uh, uh, not high rate for the production, but we uh, but there is will be increase in the future. We think that because also in the agriculture we can find that there's many other uh, sectors have been working related for policy and water management and other that can be worked to improve the agriculture sector and to uh, reduce the waste of food and uh, reduce the waste and improve the food and zero hunger. The fertilizer and nano pesticide. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture have been starting new rules for registration for fertilizer and they aim to clarify the use of this fertilizer since they known to have toxicity and high uh, toxicity. Some of them have high toxicity. So the, in the last report, they are giving a license for chemical pesticide uh, for the shop. About 150 have been given and they accept uh, around 300 from uh, entering uh, of pesticides from the other side. One and uh, fifteen around from the port, and they register about thirty-five new commercial pesticides. Uh, we can find that the, this number is low because for the new pesticides, because we find that we have more than what we need from the commercial pesticides that needed for the use, especially in the current time and the uh, and the decrease of the arable land. Uh, one of the catastrophes that happened is that in, during the last aggression on Gaza Strip, uh, there is a store for pesticides have been destroyed in Betlahia that contained a thousand of pesticides. Maybe it will be, uh, it will have an impact on the life, not on uh, in the environment and the life of the neighborhood in this uh, area. So we thought that we should have uh, a quick response and we put, thought that we might need to find a co-friendly product uh, to at least to save our environment and save our humans' lives in this area. So we thought that nanofertilizer could be have the potential to give a neutral ability and access for growing seed and that can be improve the root and the shoot uh, length. And also could give also a, a quality and yield of vegetative and proof on the growth and and uh, in the chlorophyll content. Uh, on the last uh, recently application also find that that uh, agricultural field typically consists of encyclopation of well-known herbicide, fungicide, insecticide. These are uh, synthetics could be from clay, silica, and ligulin. These are natural uh, polymers can be degraded without any effect on environment and they can be eco-friendly to be used in our country. Uh, on the other side, we found that the plant response to abiotic stress under nanoparticle have been improved during using these uh, silicon filterizer have been used 
to promote the effect of physiological and morphological effect on vegetative feature of basal and under salinity at risk. There was some improvement in, the, in these plants and the tolerance for this stress. Uh, water pollution and environmental hazards on agriculture. As we know that most of these pesticides can lead to the underground water and uh, most of this water, or we can see most of the water used in the in the Gaza Strip and West Bank is based on the groundwater, which represents 90% of the water supply. They are polluted and they are associated with agriculture to achieve uh, food security and fertilization. Uh, also, the nanotechnology can find the uh, solution for uh, water wastewater treatment and can be these sustainable and low cost. Uh, one of these solutions can be like the photocatalyst, nano absorbent, and nano membranes. These could be used like one of these is titanium oxide could be used and have effective uh, and efficiently way for wastewater treatment. On the other side, nano uh, sensor for precious farming and smart agriculture. This could be used more ICT technology on more something to monitoring and uh, follow up with the plants need, just like to uh, if there is, will be any change in the critical parameters such as temperature, pH, and humidity could be monitored and we can respond uh, quickly for this change. Uh, as we can see this plant to have a high yield of, uh, of uh, the fruit. Uh, many types of these like they include the fluorescence, uh, resonance, energy transfer based on nanosensor, carbon-based electrochemical nanosensor, plumetic uh, uh, nanoware, and antibody nanosensors. This will be just like produced from the plant as if there are any change in the plant cycle or in their signal that can produce due to the uh, stress or uh, any reaction that could happen from any predator. And also the, we can uh, monitor the solid nutrient and the fertilizer, humidity and pH, pesticide, herbicide and microcyte causing disease, uh, hormones and overall crop growth rates. This could be also monitored by the nanosensor monitor. So stress tolerance for improvement of the crop production. Non agriculture can also improve the crop yield as several research have demonstrated salinity stress, for example, can limit crop production up to 20% of the more cultivated land. They, to solve this, they have used as some uh, types of spray containing for sulfate nanoparticles. These have been uh, applied on uh, sunflower and they have been found to increase the shoot dry weight and expand the leaf of the plant. This could be used for, uh, as we have some area to, to increase their uh, salinity and are not able, uh, we are not able to use them for uh, cultivation and agriculture. We found that the conclusion after we study this uh, situation based on our country, Palestine, and what we, the challenge that we found and what is the possibility for using nanotechnology in the future of uh, the, in the near future. These are more precisely uh, the agriculture sector under development and international level. And they are, could be, they will be cheap and sure equipment of nanotechnology will be enhanced plant growth and tolerance. But, uh, and also they could be a promising solution for the current situation in Palestine and definitely will help to merge more technology in the agriculture sector. And we still need more research to be in, in this sector. And also we should have to work to, uh, build the capacity for the farmers and uh, to know how to use this technology so we can increase the yield of the production and uh, research on non-technology. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, the last uh, slide, please, please, please. And our last publication, characterization, standardization, and uh, eco-friendly in nutrient as possible, up to take translation of nanoparticle that plant is needed.
Thank you for your attention. This work was based on our research from different background. As I mentioned before, I'm from agriculture biotechnology and my colleague. We have tried to work on this one to find a new cooperation from this different background in the agriculture uh, sector. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, research. It's really interested and worthy and can uh, uh, proceed in the economic developments in Palestine. Um, we will move to the next uh, uh, speakers so we can leave all the questions at the end just to save time. Okay. Type. Um, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, speaker is Mrs. Ashwak Anajar. <clears throat> Mrs. Ashwak Anajar has finished her bachelor degree in applied biology at Palestine Polytechnic University, and she moved to do her master uh, degree at Al Quds University with a uh, scholarship from Agriculture Work Committee, and then her master thesis were done in uh, a scholar with a scholarship from the uh, uh, PJSP, Palestinian German Science Bridge, for six months under my supervision and Dr. Christina. And now uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Anajar has enrolled as a PhD student in the Institute of Bio and Geoscience, IBG2, in France Centrum Jülich in Germany, with the <clears throat> the same uh, uh, agency, I mean, uh, through the Palestinian German Science uh, British, uh, with the uh, under supervision of Dr. Arnett Kochen and Christina Kochendorf from uh, Yolish and uh, me from Palestine Polytechnic University. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Ashwak will talk about her uh, research as Microalgae and biochar agrofiltration of the Palestinian Rehan barley cultivar under salinity stress. So, Mrs. Ashwak, it's your uh, turn now. Thanks, Dr. Shah, for introducing me. Can you see my screen? <coughs> yes. 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 That's good. I will start. Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Ashwak Najar. I'm a PhD student at IBG2 Forschung Syndrome Mulich in Germany. Um, as Dr. Sharif said, my topic today uh, will be about microalgae and biochar agrofertilization of Palestinian rehab particle under salinity stress. As an introduction, I will talk about the Palestinian agriculture status and its challenges. The Palestinian agriculture environment is suffering from high degradation and loss in uh, the agricultural lands. This is due to many problems. First of all, salinity. Salinity is one of the major of apiotic stresses factors uh, that decreases crop uh, yield in arid and semi-arid area. <coughs> In Jericho, we, see, uh, we can see that the agriculture shifted the planting of vegetables to palm trees due to high increasing uh, in salinity levels in the soil in Jericho. Secondly, soil contamination. Soil contamination affects both soil properties and uh, crop yield, especially in quarries and their landfills. Soil infertility uh, um, exist due to uh, excessive uh, use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Also water scarcity due to the Israeli settlements and low rainwater rate can affect highly the agriculture in Palestine. To solve that, these problems, our project or our research uh, uh, suggested uh, many solutions uh, to solve part of these problems. First of all, the transfer of nutrients uh, to organic fertilizers. Uh, in this regard, we uh, transferred the needed nutrients for plant growth to uh, chlorella vulgaris algae biomass 
the biomass was used uh, as a biofertilizer uh, in poor nutrient soil uh, to support plant growth. This, uh, this work was done already uh, in IBG2 Fortune Syndrome Mulish uh, at 2002. 